Contested Bones, Part 4. We've been looking at the book Contested Bones by uh, Christopher Roop and John Sanford, just published this last year. Um, and uh, it's available on the internet, but it will cost you, and it will take a little while to get it. Uh, the cover looks like that. The uh, two authors, Christopher Roop on the left and John Sanford on the right. And what we've got covered so far is the prologue in three chapters. Uh, the prologue outlines how John Sanford, the second author, believed in evolution until around the age of 50 when he realized the impotence of evolution to get from amoeba to man and the impact of genetic entropy, what you might call devolution, and realize you couldn't get there from, uh, get here from there uh, without some help. And not only that, but that, uh, that species shouldn't last for millions of years and became a short age creationist, but then had cognitive dissonance with, quote, all the fossil evidence of man evolving from apes, end quote. And he and uh, one of his protégés, Chris Rupp, set out to investigate. Chapter one discusses the advancing apes icon, that familiar uh, ape to man transition that was painted with very little evidence. The evolutionary story, the scientific method, and taxonomic principles kind of setting the stage. Chapter two gives the textbook picture uh, which follows Darwin's expectation is in fact straight line evolution. Although the field is now widely acknowledged to be much more bush-like and some in the field actually, including evolutionists, um, state that the ascent of man cannot be traced, which is kind of interesting uh, statement. Almost all of the fossils are contested and one of the contesting parties or more are compatible with the theory that uh, uh, Christopher Roop and John Sanford propose at the end. Chapter three can be summarized with very simply, Neanderthals are basically human variants. And now we come to chapter four, which is Homo erectus, and the question they raise is upright ape man or fully human? And the quote at the beginning is, does Homo erectus exist as a true taxon or should it be sunk into Homo sapiens? Or if you prefer merged instead of sunk, it means the same thing. And that's a question raised by Michael Day, professor of anatomy at the University of London. And as far as I know, a believer in uh, ape to man transition. New species or anatomical variation within Homo sapiens is how the lead of uh, the first section of the book. Certain bones have been classified as Homo erectus. We will usually refer, refer to these bones simply as erectus, meaning upright man, erect. These bones are claimed to represent an extinct transitional form between the Australopithecine apes and modern humans and are used as one of the primary arguments for human evolution. There is growing evidence that indicates that what has been called erectus is fully human, just as a significant number of paleo experts have always maintained. That's not a new opinion in other words. Erectus is essential to the ape to man story and so textbooks, museums, and TV programs still insist that erectus is less than human. Their primary argument is based upon the fact that erectus had an atypical skull, very similar to Neanderthal. However, unlike Neanderthal, erectus had reduced brain volume. In addition, some erectus bones indicate reduced body size and other pathologies. 
There's evidence that these traits can best be understood as being the result of reductive selection, inbreeding, and genetic degeneration. So if you want to say it is subhuman, well, maybe in certain ways. We, the authors, stand with the paleo experts who lump Homo erectus with Homo sapiens. Should be in the same species, according to the lumpers and the authors of the book. In our view, they are both erect, they are both intelligent, they are clearly human. While Erectus is clearly human, it is not a normal human. Erectus was very much like Neanderthal, but displaying evidence of various pathologies. Many Erectus skulls are disturbing, showing diverse abnormalities and asymmetries. It is said that Erectus skulls have certain primitive, or ape-like, features. These phenotypic differences seem to have been exaggerated and are not so much primitive as they are degenerate. And that's the way they spell it in the book. The most striking features of erectus are small body size and reduced brain volume. These features do not seem to be so much ape-like as they seem to reflect pathology. Even these path pathological features fall within the range of variation seen within Homo sapiens. So they're basically they're setting out where they're going to go at the end. In this chapter, we will show that hunter-gatherer groups that are subject to inbreeding and reductive selection are prone to developing abnormal skulls. That is, people that we would consider normal, completely human. Hunter-gatherer groups can survive for many generations in small geographically isolated tribes, resulting in severe inbreeding and accelerated mutation accumulation. Erectus was clearly such a population, being a hunter-gatherer people that lived in isolation over many generations in remote places such as the Indonesian islands of Java and Flores. Interesting that Erectus was in Flores. Under such conditions, distinctive skeletal features are expected to arise and become established in small populations. We will discuss how much, how, pardon me, how both genetic and non-genetic influences can produce erectus-like features in modern Homo sapiens. And uh, there's a mutation that the uh, mutation fixer did not, did not get. That should say this evidence supports the interpretation that erectus is more appropriately a variant, a degenerative form of Homo sapiens, and is not a transitional form between apes and man. Background and discovery of erectus. In 1891, the Dutch anatomist Eugene Dubois, I think I've got that right, uh, discovered the first fossil remains that are currently classified as Homo erectus. Charles Darwin's newly published works inspired Dubois, and so he set off to the Indonesian island of Java in search of a missing link between apes and humans. Along the banks of the Solo River near the village of Trinel, he found a tooth, a skull cap, and a femur bone, and you're about to see them. There's the tooth, the femur bone, and then the skull at the top, and in the inset, there's another view of the skull. The femur bone was unmistakably human, but the skull cap had some unusual features, in particular, a low forehead with heavy brow ridges. Dubois interpreted the skull cap as having ape-like qualities and assigned the bones to a new species that he c named Pithecanthropus erectus. According to Wikipedia, um, it was at first Anthropopithecus erectus, which is just taking the two things and moving them. So it was a man-ape at first, and then it was the ape-man. The Greek-Latin name translates as upright ape-man in accordance with Dubois' fur but firm belief that humans evolved from ape-like creatures. These bones came to be popularly recognized by the general public as Java Man, a name still used today. Since then, numerous bones from Java and China have been found and reassigned to Homo erectus. Uh, reassigned because originally it was Peking Man and there was another name, another genus and another species for that. And then Ernst Meyer said, no, they're all Homo erectus considered to be the immediate ancestor of Homo sapiens, and that's probably true for most, pe uh, most evolutionists. However, as is typical in the field of paleoanthropology, experts disagree about how to interpret this fossil. Lumpers view these bones as an early form of Homo sapiens. 
These researchers challenged the erected species designation and would classify these bones as Homo sapiens. Worldwide, there have been about 300 erectus finds, most often consisting of an isolated skull cap or, and or a few broken bones or teeth. These remains have been found in Indonesia, Java man, China, Peking man, and also in Europe, Africa, and possibly India. The African form of Homo erectus is often referred to as Homo ergaster, obviously another splitter at work. Until very recently, only one nearly complete erectus skeleton has been recovered, which was dubbed Turkana Boy. It was found in Kenya in 1984 and is the only Homo erectus or Homo ergaster skeleton where the skull has been found clearly associated with the rest of the body. Other than that, you had skulls here, femurs over somewhere else, and you had to kind of guess that they were actually the same species. Uh, one intact femur they give mixed with numerous broken femurs, but that doesn't really help you a whole lot. Two prominent paleo experts, Ian Tattersall and Jeffrey Swartz, noted that the general absence of other erectus bones confounded the analysis of Turkana boy. Although it is truly remarkable just how much a, of a single individual skeleton could be recovered, this amazing find also presented a dilemma because Homo erectus or not, most of it couldn't be compared with anything else closely related to it because the comparable parts weren't known. In terms of age, the earliest erectus remains were dated to be 1.9 million years old. The species is thought to have persisted until about 500,000 to 140,000 years ago, which would be 0 0.14 million years old. Um, but some studies have suggested they may have lived as recently as 20, which is 0 0.02 million years old. Um, thus, the estimated time when Erectus lived would have spanned roughly 2 million years. The Java skull cap, discovered by Eugene Dubois, is the type specimen or defining specimen of the Homo erectus species. This is problematic since it is essentially just a skull cap. On the other hand, Turkana boy is the most complete erectus skeleton and would arguably be the better choice for a type specimen. But of course, the type specimen is always the first, so tough luck. The Java skull cap is the type specimen. It has a low brain case with a long, sloping forehead. The brow ridges are pronounced and continue straight across. From it, for its small size, the skull is fairly elongated. In frontal view, the skull is wide with a slight depression on either side of the midline. In side view, the rear of the skull, known as the occipital region, is V-shaped. The cranial capacity is estimated to be approximately 940 uh, cubic centimeters, considerably larger than apes, but overlaps with the lower end of human variation, which goes down to 700 for what it's worth. Oh, and there's, you can see the, uh, the, low, the brow ridges, the low sloping forehead, coming back to kind of a V at the end of the occiput. Generally speaking, these features, large brow ridges, sloping foreheads, and small cranial capacities, are characteristic of most erectus specimens. In skulls that preserve the face, which that one didn't, of course, they typically exhibit marked prognathism, a forward projecting jaw, and lack a distinct chin. However, it is important to realize there's considerable variation in the skulls assigned to this species. A figure from a paper recently published in Science, 2014, how they got permission to use this, I don't know, um, <clears throat> displays the extent of variation in erectus, reflecting an ongoing debate within the paleoanthropological community. Note that many erectus skulls appear deformed and asymmetrical even after correcting for postmortem fossil damage. This is consistent with the idea that these individuals suffered from pathologies, as will be discussed. And there's the photo, or the, uh, uh, the illustration, straight from uh, uh, secular literature. And uh, if, if you're looking at this really quickly, you'll notice Trinil 2, which is our uh, uh, Java man of Dubois, Pithecanthropus, 
is there and also there and it, this is basically frontal view and side view of the skulls and you can see the brow ridges on most of them um, that one doesn't have much in the way of brow ridges so you know there's a little variation there um, Uh, they, he mentions five skulls, di or they mentioned five skulls di discovered in Demonici. I'm not sure how you pronounce that. Uh, ex exhibited a small, a marked degree of variant, variation in size and shape. Researchers noted that if the skulls had been found separately, they would have been uh, considered different species. But because they were found in close proximity to one another and dated to the same age, it was argued that they belong, belong to a single evolving line, lineage, Homo erectus. As the Manisi uh, team leader, David Lord, uh, Lord Kipanidzi noted, if you found the, the Manisi skulls in, at isolated sites in Africa, some people would give them different species names but one population can have all this variation. We're using five or six names, but they could all be from one lineage. Not surprisingly, other paleo experts disagree and insist the skulls should be viewed as different species that live side by side because they look too different to be the same species. Again, do you define species as different morphology or do you define them as can interbreed? This type of controversy in the field is common. Paleoanthropologists have long acknowledged that the morphological boundary between Erectus and Homo sapiens is arbitrary and not clearly demarcated. However, as we will demonstrate in this chapter, most of the remains erect attributed to Erectus are fully human and should therefore be reclassified as Homo sapiens as the lumpers in the field advocate. Prominent paleo experts agree Homo erectus is Homo sapiens. The evolutionary paleo experts known as lumpers have insisted for decades that the variation found within erectus specimens overlap extensively with modern humans. On that basis, such lumpers agree that erectus should be grouped together with Homo sapiens as a single species. Many other paleo experts object to this and claim that erectus exhibits a distinct morphology that merits its classification as a separate species. While it is true Erectus exhibits some distinctive traits, it does not logically follow that they must be therefore viewed as a separate subhuman species. Human skeletons come in many different shapes and sizes. In modern populations, distinct traits in the face and cranium serve to recognize as recognizable people groups. Forensic scientists are able to identify which people group a particular modern skull belong to by looking at diagnostic traits. However, no scientist today would claim that the distinctive skull features in modern people groups prove they belong to a different species. Morphological is not as good as the interbreeding criterion. As Gabriel Lasker, the internationally known evolutionary paleo expert from Wayne State University conceded, Homo erectus is distinct from modern man, Homo sapiens, but there is a tendency to exaggerate the differences. Even if one ignores transitional or otherwise hard to classify specimens and limits consideration to the Java or Peking populations, the range of variations of many features of Homo erectus fall within that of modern man. Paleo expert Milford uh, Wolpoff, recipient of the Darwin Lifetime Achievement Award, agrees with this view, as do his colleagues Alan Thorne and Wu Xin Ji. Uh, they note that the differences between the two are arbitrary and should be regarded as the same species. I'm sure that, and they should be regarded as the same species. In our view, there are two alternatives. We should either admit that ho the Homo erectus Homo sapiens boundary is arbitrary and use non-morphological, that is temporal, criteria for determining it, or Homo erectus should be sunk into Homo sapiens. In other words, we either use, the, well, they're older than so old and therefore they're Homo erectus, or else you just call it the same species. Now, uh, we'll try to see if we can remember to come back to that at the end. Um, 
Michael Day asked, does Homo erectus exist as a true taxon or should it be sunk into Homo sapiens? Sinking Homo erectus into Homo sapiens would mean simultaneously folding in other very similar species such as Homo heidelbergensis, Homo rhodesiensis, Homo antecessor, Homo ergaster, and all other so-called archaic humans. Erectus skeleton indistinguishable from modern humans. Since the d time of Dubois, it has been claimed that the Java man type erectus is a subhuman ancestor. Yet almost a century passed before any substantial erectus skeleton was found. This happened with the discovery of Tricanoboy in 1984. Prior to that time, almost no non-skull postcranial bones were recovered. Just a severely diseased and distorted partial skeleton from Kenya with no analytical value. A partial pelvis and one complete femur and other bone fragments. As Nature reports in the discovery paper detailing the anatomy of Turkana boy, previous Homo erectus postcranial material has been either fragmentary, not definitely associated, disputed as to species, or diseased. From Trinil, Indonesia, there are several fragmentary and one complete, but pathological, femora. Despite the fact that it was these specimens that led to the species name, there are doubts as to whether they are Homo erectus, with the most recent consensus being that they probably, they probably are not. Until recently, the only Homo erectus postcranial bones from China were from Zhukou Dian, and these were very fragmentary with no complete lengths or articular or joint surfaces. Nevertheless, even before 1984, it had been, become apparent to researchers that the postcranial anatomy of erectus was virtually indistinguishable from that of modern humans. For example, leading paleo experts F. Clark Howell and Bernard Campbell offered their evaluation of the postcranial anatomy of erectus, stating, his bones were heavier and thicker than a modern man's, and bigger bones required thicker muscles to move them. These skeletal differences, however, were not particularly noticeable. Below the neck, one expert had noted, the differences between Homo erectus and today's man could only be detected by an experienced anatomist. The Institute of Human Origin, founded by Donald Johansson, that's of Lucy fame, posted an article affirming this assessment. The discovery of Turkana boy in 1984 not only helped to validate these early evaluations, a volcanic tuff underlying the bones was potassium argon dated to 1.6 million years old. So it's younger than 1.6 million years. Uh, Turkana boy is recognized as the most complete erectus skeleton ever found, only missing part of the skull and much of the hands and feet. Upon examining the bones, it was immediately obvious that erectus was anatomically human. Figure four, which we will see in the next slide. Um, Seddon, a human evolution researcher and author of Humans from the Beginning, notes, Turkana boy was unquestionably human. Period. Uh, Mariette de Cristina, editor-in-chief of Scientific American, lists a suite of anatomical features that she refers to as hallmarked traits of the human body. And there's your uh, Turkana boy. As you can see, we're missing one of the humeruses. We're missing uh, most of the hands, all of the feet. But we got a lot of the rest of it. In, in uh, her assessment, Turkana Boy exhibited all major postcranial features characteristic of modern human anatomy. These include low shoulders, barrel-shaped rib cage, as opposed to funnel, um, strong wrist, long thumb, long flexible waist, twisted humerus, come with the hands coming forward instead of off to the side, um, forwardly placed opening for the spinal cord, um, short broad pelvis, enlarged femur head, strong knee joint, arched foot, and short toes. John Reeder, distinguished expert on human origins, also noted the striking modernity of the skeleton. No paleo expert doubts that the overall size and body proportions of Turkana boy are anatomically modern. 
Dental evidence and unfused growth plates suggest he was an adolescent no older than 12 or 13 years of age. At the time of death, he would have stood five foot three inches, but had he lived to adulthood, he could have grown to six foot one inch in height. In other words, pretty decent size. All of these features demonstrate Turcanaboy was fully human from the neck down. And as we will see, this is also true of the skull. It is for this reason that leading experts acknowledge Homo erectus re represents the emergence of the modern body. This is a clear admission that e erectus is anatomically human. Well, except for the skull. It has been noted from the neck down, the skeleton is virtually indistinguishable from that of a modern Kenyan bushman. It is no wonder a bishop from Kenya is calling on locals to demand the Turkanaboy display be removed from Kenya's National Museum to be properly buried. His body, apart from his skull, is surprisingly like our own. The most obvious difference when uh, seen when the Turkanaboy was compared to modern humans was the size and shape of his brain case, which was characteristic of other erectus skulls, discussed later in this chapter. If paleo experts openly acknowledge that erectus exhibit a postcranial anatomy almost identical to modern humans, on what grounds can they insist it was a subhuman species? With respect to the postcranial anatomy, the vertebral canal is one of the few noticeable features, at least if you're a trained anatomist, that have been emphasized by paleo experts to set erectus apart from Homo sapiens. Seddon reiterates the claim originally put forth by McLarnon and Hewitt. The Turkanaboy had a much narrower thoracic vert vertebral canal. I wish they'd stop saying that. I'd like to say 20% or 50% or something like that. Much means what in this context? The vertebral canal is the space in the vertebral column through which the nerve bearing spinal cord passes and the thoracic vertebra are those located between the neck and the base of the rib cage. The nerve, nerves passing through this region control breathing and he might therefore have lacked fine breathing control necessary for modern speech. In suggesting this, the researchers are trying to find a possible reason to downgrade Homo erectus to a subhuman species. Some paleo experts refuse to accept erect erectus as being human. In seeking to demote erectus, there seems to have been a tendency to rely on minutia, such as the exact size of the vertebral canal. Realistically, there is no way to tell if a slightly narrowed vertebral canal would affect speech. Ella Bin, expert in spinal pathology and path uh, spinal anatomy and pathology from Tel Aviv University, does not believe Turkanaboy would have had any difficulty breathing because of the small vertebral canal. Uh, Dr. Soder, a prominent surgeon from the UK, agrees, saying, and before we get to him, I'll just point out that the uh, diaphragm is innervated from C3, 4, and 5, which means that that's before the vertebral canal gets there. So you're talking about the uh, rib uh, innervation rather than full control of breathing. This is pure speculation since the spinal cord contains a vast number of nerve fibers, only a small portion of which are related to the control of the muscles of the rib cage and diaphragm. And actually not at all in the diaphragm. We can be sure that a narrower spinal canal is of no relevance to defining whether or not Turkanaboy could or could not speak since three-year-old children are well able to speak with also narrow canals, but anyway. Uh, if this is the level of minutia that defines whether a specimen is human or subhuman, then one would have no choice but to relegate many modern humans to a subhuman species as well. This would include bones belonging to North American Indians. The evolutionary anatomist Owen Lovejoy has acknowledged that it is easy to make this mistake. In a 1,000-year-old North American burial site containing Native American skeletal remains, Lovejoy observed many features that seem to exceed the normal range of human variation. As reader notes, the Amerindian collection on which Lovejoy works undoubtedly represents a population belonging to the species Homo sapiens. Yet it includes many unusual bones that probably would have been assigned to different species or even a different genus if they had been discovered as individual fossils, or maybe if they'd been discovered in Africa. Um, 
Erectus skull morphology found in modern humans. The most distinctive features of the erectus are seen in the skull. Erectus specimens are typically identified based upon a smaller brain case than the average modern human, a heavier brow ridge, a more sloping forehead, a reduced chin, more constricted temples, larger teeth, and a more forward projecting jaw. Prognathism. These characteristics are commonly discussed as if they are unique to the erectus type. The evolutionary justification for the establishment of erectus as a subhuman species is built around the assumption that the same traits are not found in modern humans. However, there are a number of modern examples of human skulls exhibiting classic erectus features that discredit this assumption, such as post-erectus archaic humans from East Asia and Australia. In addition to normal variation in skull type, abnormal skulls, especially reduced brain volume, can arise due to pathologies. It is, uh, pardon me, this, and there's another mutation that, that escaped the mutation corrector, is seen in the case of the Zika virus, which is spread by the Aedes mosquito. This virus is believed to have originated in the Zika forest of Uganda, about 300 miles from where Turkanaboy was found. The first reported case was in 1952. When pregnant women, I'm sure that should be women, or but anyway, become infected with this virus, their child or children can be born with severe microcephaly, resulting in reduced brain volumes compar comparable to erectus. It'll be interesting to see whether they also have uh, heavier brow ridges than usual. Um, that may be asking too much from this book, but, uh, but that, would be a, that would be an interesting research project. Microcephaly can produce constricted temples, prognathism, pronounced brow ridges, so apparently sometimes you do get those brow ridges. Uh, abnormally small brain cases and a V-shaped occipital region features commonly seen in erectus skulls. It is possible some of examples of erectus could have arisen in a similar way. Microcephaly can also be caused by mutations. This is especially relevant to erectus, a people that lived in small, genetically isolated hunter-gatherer groups. Intermarriage between closely related members of a group over many generations should accelerate mutation rates. Geneticist Michael Lynch recently reported in the journal Genetics that hypermutation is especially likely to occur if mutations arise in genes encoding DNA repair enzymes. And in fact, in medicine, we know a few of those kinds of things um, where repair, uh, fragile X syndrome, I think is, one of them. Microcephaly can also be caused by malnutrition, diets lacking sufficient nutrients, as expected in hunter-gatherer lifestyles, as well as overexposure to toxic chemicals and ionizing radiation, which of course is more common in caves. Healthy modern humans can also display erectus-like features. Rampasasa pygmies from the island of Flores are prone to prognathism and a receding chin. We, one of these days we should have a photo of that. Uh, other unique looking people groups such as Eskimos and Alouettes have been noted to share features with Asian erectus specimens. Leading proponents of the multi-regional community model have noted striking similar similarities between erectus skulls and those belonging to Australian Homo sapiens who lived in the relatively recent past but I don't think anybody's gonna claim that Australian Aborigines are subhuman. Um, although to be fair, there was a time when people did that. That's generally conceded to have not been a good time. And then he talks about the erectus cranium from Java known as Sangarin 7, and we have a photo of the uh, Coast Swamp, which is in Australia and then and Sanger in 17, and you can see the sloping forehead, the heavy brow ridges, and uh, uh, although the faces are relatively straight there. Although, according to one recently developed model, Erectus from Java, Homo erectus soloensis, uh, migrated to Australia around 13, 130 to 150,000 years ago to become the re robust Australian type, which preserved the erectus-like features of the cranium. 
Uh, there's another mutation I missed. This event was followed by a later colonization of Homo sapiens from Africa that merged to form a single population through genetic mixing, the interbreeding of the two species. If two populations are able to interbreed, they are considered the same species. Therefore, if Erectus and Homo sapiens interbred, they are by definition the same species. And it's reasonable to suppose that happened. A growing number of researchers believe that many of the traits in common between Erectus and the cow swamp samples, that's where KS came from, are due to non-genetic influences known as phenotypic plasticity, morphologies that are shaped by developmental interactions among cells, tissues in their environments called epigenesis. And I might point out that Zika virus is one of those possible uh, non-genetic influences. Erectus brain size overlaps with that of modern humans. The volume of, uh, volumes of ape brain cases tend to fall in the range of 390 to 540 cubic centimeters, and that's CM3, and I missed uh, making that big, with male gorillas being at the upper end of the spectrum, 540. Normal human brain case volumes vary greatly, ranging between 800 and uh, 2,220 ce uh, cubic centimeters with an average of about 1,345. Erectus cranial capacities are on average 940 centimeters and range anywhere between 700 and 1400. So 700 is really kind of small. Turkana boy is 880, which is at the lower range, but definitely within it, uh, uh, cubic centimeters, but could have reached uh, 1,000 cubic centimeters in adulthood, in which case he would be a you know, pretty decent human. Um, if solo man, specimens from Java are included, which are typically identified as erectus, Cranial capacity ranges, from, uh, ranges up to 1,250 cubic centimeters, approaching the modern human average. The uh, vertizoius, uh, occipital bone attributed to erectus, reveal an even larger cranial capacity of 1,400 cubic centimeters. So apparently it could be actually slightly larger than human. Did erectus have subhuman intelligence? Erectus had smaller brain volumes, but were they less intelligent than modern man? Not necessarily. Brain size varies according to body size and does not clearly correlate with intelligence. Neanderthals had larger brains than the average modern human, averaging about 1487. And uh, people were trying to make Neanderthals stupid, but maybe they weren't. Anatoly France was the winner of the 1921 Nobel Prize for Literature. His cranial capacity was 933 cubic centimeters. The same size as many erectus specimens, such as Java Man and Turkana Boy. And of course, Turkana Boy hadn't finished growing. A man named Daniel Lyon had a cranial capacity of 660 cubic centimeters. Yet he lived a normal life and worked for the Pennsylvania Railway Terminal for 20 years in the late 1800s. Lyon was able to read and write and had no signs of mental deficiency. The impressive cultural inventory of Erectus. Many have expressed opinions of the low intelligence level of Erectus, generally based upon evolutionary preconceptions, not actual physical evidence. For example, it has been claimed that Erectus was only capable of the most rudimentary human speech and was not capable of using words. How you would know from looking at the skull? I don't know. Claims like this are inherently speculative. It is common practice among cultural anthropologists to associate a lack of sophisticated tools with subhuman status. Yet there are examples of present day tribes that use stone tools and lack modern technological cap capabilities. In these cases, it would, be, it would obviously be a mistake to assume that using crude stone tools reflects subhuman intelligence. Consider the Tasmanians of Australia. Uh, the sparse cultural inventory of the Tasmanians has nothing to do with evolution, or lack thereof, but is instead attributed to cultural degeneration leading to loss of technology. When you think about it, if you were to suddenly have everybody else around you killed, and you and your spouse were the only people left, uh, well maybe if you're my age, 
um, and somebody younger as well so that they can have kids, how many of us could reproduce the technology that we have? And how many of us could pass that on to our kids? It's pretty hard. Now, contrary to long-held assumptions, we are finding that Erectus had an impressive cultural inventory, richer, in fact, than that of the Tasmanians and some other isolated tribes living today. A striking piece of evidence in support of the fully human status of Erectus is their inferred ability to sail, a finding that has stunned evolutionary paleoanthropologists. Um, this is a... Uh, one of the figures in the book, and you will notice that between the uh, islands there are gaps. This one in particular is known as Wallace's Line, or part of it anyway, the part that goes through here. Uh, Wallace's Line goes up into the, uh, uh, past the Philippines as well. And it's a place where animals don't get from mainland Asia to uh, Australia, they stop at Bali. And the reason why is because there's so much different distance between the, the uh, islands at that point. And there is a current that is constantly going. So if you got started, you would find yourself swept out to sea. And Discover Magazine has a quote that they use. What kind of brain does it take to build bo a boat and steer it across 15 miles of choppy sea and strong currents? Could a chimp do it? Not likely. It's a pretty formidable wa uh, water crossing, Morwood says. Pre presumably they didn't swim. Nor does Morwood think they could have crossed the strait in any significant numbers by accident, hanging onto logs or crude rafts. I think you need directed watercraft, he says. You'd have to do some uh, have to have some means of steering and some means of propulsion. If you try to put a few logs together and jump on it, you're probably going to die. To make such a voyage, it has been argued, requires quintessentially modern skills, not just technical ones, but the ability to plan, to work as a group, even to talk. Remember, it won't do you any good if one guy gets over. Got to have a guy and a girl, minimum. For the sake of brevity, Erectus associated artifacts and skills are summarized below. And I'm going to skip over the summary in the interest of time because we really don't have that kind of time. Um, does Erectus show gen in evidence of genetic degeneration? While Erectus appears to be fully human, Erectus populations are now extinct and they appear to have been highly inbred and genetically compromised. Although erectus brain volume overlaps with modern brain volumes, it is consistently on the lower end of the spectrum. Similarly, the erectus cultural inventory is distinctly human, but it is on the low end of the spectrum. There seems to be an ele element of degeneration and pathology inherent in these populations. A modern example of this type of small population would be the pygmies of Central Africa and the San or Bushmen of South Africa. Hunter-gatherer groups must live in small bands to survive. This leads to a very serious problem associated with genetic inbreeding. In addition to genetic degeneration associated with small population sizes, it is widely recognized that reduction in physical size, especially brain size, can arise due to what is called reductive evolution. It is well established that reduced size in general, but especially reduced brain size, is adaptive in undernourished populations. That's because the brain is 5% of the body, but uses 20% of the body's resting energy supply. Conclusion, Erectus was fully human. There is very strong evidence that the bones commonly referred to as Homo erectus are fully human individuals who suffered from various pathologies associated with such things as inbreeding, mutation, teratogens, uh, developmental abnormalities, etc. It is clear that the claims that Erectus was a subhuman species are contested among leading evolutionary paleo experts. While some insist that Erectus was morphologi morphologically distinct from modern man, others point out that Erectus morphology overlaps extensively with modern humans, and so Erectus should be reclassified as Homo sapiens. While some claim they were our progenitors, others acknowledge that they coexisted and interbred with anatomically modern homo, homo sapiens. Mm, 
looks like something a, a tele, telecyst escaped here. While some attribute the difference in skull shape of erectus in modern man to progressive evolution, others would attribute the erectus skull morphology to multiple factors, including reductive evolution. So you can believe who you want to on that. The ability of erectus to sail across 10 to 15 mile wide deep water straits against strong ocean currents speaks powerfully of human intelligence. Likewise, the controlled use of fire, sophisticated language, and paleo art reveal a human mind and soul. Moreover, the uh, overall morphology of Erectus overlaps extensively with modern humans, as paleoanthropologists freely confess. The Erectus postcranial skeleton is indistinguishable from that of modern Homo sapiens, apart from subtle differences detectable only through the eyes of a trained anatomist. Indeed, most of the classic features at attributed to Erectus, including those found in the skull and face, have been found in modern humans. For all these reasons, evolutionary paleo experts known as lumpers acknowledge that Erectus is a variant of Homo sapiens. We agree. Now, my take on all that, I think that the chapter does make a convincing argument that Erectus, along with Ergaster, Rhodesian Man, Antecessor, and Heidelberg Man, were human variants. They seem to have had human capabilities. One can use, uh, use them as primitive humans with some ape-like features if one wants to, but they are close to modern humans. Remember the Bush theory of human evolution? The Bush theory of human evolution is okay, but we need to have somewhere a main stem. Common descent requires that some population had continuous ancestor-descendant relationships between apes and humans. The traditional picture, the one that shows the ape to man ascent, is there with, of course, chimpanzees remaining the same or perhaps moving in a slightly different direction. A more sophisticated version would have several populations evolving simultaneously, perhaps with some crossing. And again, you can f have uh, groups that perhaps stayed at one, pot, uh, one spot or branched off, if you want. Um, a more modern way of looking at it would be to have sudden evolution from humans, apes to humans, and uh, a la Stephen Jay Gould and uh, Niels Eldridge, uh, with the evolution being so sudden that you can't find the intermediates. What you cannot have is two lines by themselves, no matter how well they're branched. You have to have something in the middle. If, if you can trace humans back far enough, you have to have a, an evolution before that sometime before that. Maybe slow, maybe fast, but sometime. Don't have that, this is a failed tree. Last week we talked about Neanderthals, which are either very close to human or perhaps even uh, more human than human. Remember, they have larger skulls than most humans. Uh, this week we talked about Homo erectus and Homo erectus was around longer than Neanderthals. Um, uh, perhaps a little lower on the scale if you're doing from ape to human. Um, but the, from the sound of it, the uh, body is actually human. It's only the brain case <coughs> that gives us trouble. Um, it could fit in the standard order but it certainly isn't the missing link, and it could just as easily fit as some kind of a degeneration from modern humans. But uh, that's my opinion. Now it's your turn. The m microphone. <laughs> is in my lap, I guess, so I have to at least start the conversation. I, I don't have the expertise to look at all the 
intricate variations of all these skulls, we have a lot more evidence now to base some fairly solid conclusions on. So I'm not going to uh, comment on the conclusions of the paleoanthropologists. It seems they're moving in the direction of, of lumping instead of splitting. Is that, is that the take that you have on it? Is that the direction paleo uh, yeah, that's a, in general are going? That's what I get from here. Yeah, th this, uh, that's definitely the direction the book is going. I know the book is going that way, but are paleoanthropologists going that, that way? They, that paleoanthropologists are going that way. I think that you're actually seeing two different trends, and it depends on how much, uh, how much interpretation you want to do using evolutionary okay. theory. What? If you're looking at, if you're just looking at the evidence and saying, well, you know, how close to human is this? It sounds like it's pretty close. I think what you're saying is paleoanthropologists are splitting apart further and further on the identification of, you know, homo, or not homo, but uh, anyway, homo ergaster and all of these other um, supposedly ape men. Uh -huh. And some are still sticking with the traditional theory and some are splitting off. So right. we have a diverging consensus yeah. instead of a merging consensus, right. it seems like. And, and part of that, I think, is uh, a pressure that we need ape men. And so can we make this into an ape man? That leads to my next comment. You have bias on both sides. I, I have to be look at the overall picture. And I'll get to the bias of these two authors. The bias now of merging is that you need a direct line that becomes more and more human. And the erectus are not totally human in all aspects. Otherwise, we would call them Homo sapiens sapiens, right? But they're still in the Homo sapiens spectrum you might say. Uh, the, the lumpers would say they're basically they're homo sapiens. And so you need that for an evolutionary scenario of the main branch. This yeah. is still part of the main. So their, their bias is looking for something in the main branch that will lead to modern humans. Right. That's, that's their bias. The bias of the two authors is quite obvious when you look at flood geology. Now, keep in mind, John Sanford gave a lecture on this campus saying that genetic studies prove that the human race cannot be much more than 6,000 years old. And you may have heard him, and I think several people were here that heard that. And that's because I, I didn't of hear that particular genetic thing, entropy, and he comes out very strong on the 6,000 years. Uh, well, yeah, actually, there's literature support for his position. Yeah, yeah, okay. Uh, granted that that is the scenario, then you have the flood approximately 16 to 1700 years after that. Then you can date the flood to around 2300 BC, 2, plus or minus whatever, yeah. 100 or 200 years. The problem I have with all of this evidence, how much genetic change can you have in just a few generations right after the flood. There's an awful lot of change and a widespread divergence. Now some people would say these are antediluvians and they were destroyed in the flood, um, but I just got a letter from Andrew Snelling last month about Pleistocene deposits and these are all found in Pleistocene. Yeah, right. They're all acknowledged as being Pleistocene. He says creationists no longer put the Pleistocene in the flood, mainstream creationists. There's a few individuals that do. Yeah. So if that's true, you can't put them in the flood. You have to put them after the flood. And Which means there's a lot, a lot of variation of, happening fairly rapidly. These authors haven't even begun that scenario. They need a follow-up book saying, what do you do? Because you have modern humans appearing very rapidly after the flood, Egyptian tombs, Babylonian graves, and so on. You have a lot of uh, moderns appearing. Why don't you have the moderns and the uh, 
you know, these other pre-modern forms, they should be popping up together. Maybe they will. I don't know. Anyway, that's food for thought, my overall analysis. I agree. Um, as, I, as I recall, in general, and <clears throat> I'm not, I don't, don't have real good data on this, uh, the pattern was uh, you find a skull and it's a new species. And uh, the thing got so hopelessly uh, confusing that it forced a, uh, a lumper correction. Yeah. To where we got to something we could handle. <laughs> uh, and um, supposedly this was okay, but uh, it did not stop the trend. It was a definite step backward. Uh, uh, for for those who uh, were uh, well, not lumpers. Yeah. Uh, but uh, it's very hard to to uh, stop that. You find something new, you want to make it a new species. Right. Uh, well, there's a so that your discovery is significant. Yeah. Uh, I think uh, it's it's getting back to the same thing again. I mean, uh, the the uh, lumper correction uh, did not last. Well, I think there's uh, something else that's going on, and you have to keep this in mind. Um, for the standard evolutionary community. Uh, this is not thought of as more than a taxonomic problem. How do you name things? And so they don't really care whether it's uh, you lump them in with Homo sapiens or not. Um, creationists, of course, are interested because if you can lump them all either with Homo sapiens or with some Australopithecine and there's nothing in between, well, you know, then they can say, well, the fossil record is actually compatible, maybe even arguing for a creationist scenario. Uh, whereas what they're looking at is, well, let's supposing that they're 98% uh, <coughs> instead of 90% human. Well, that just moves them up on the list, they still they still can claim that there is a, uh, and, and if we keep looking for fossils, we'll find them, that there's intermediates that go all the way down. Um, and if push came to shove, they could always do the old um, Gould thing, where you go, well, you know, the, the evolution between, let's say, Let's say there's a gap between Australopithecus afarensis, Lucy, and uh, Homo, uh, uh, Homo erectus. And that was spanned within 12,000 years, and it was spanned in a place where, there, where, where we weren't laying down strata, and so you, you don't have any evidence. You know, what happened to your homework? Well, the dog ate it. Well, the dog is really good at eating homework. He, he likes homework. Um, and so you just kind of shrug your shoulders and say, well, you know, it happened. And so a lot of this really doesn't determine what's going on. Because either side can make, uh, can accommodate almost any data. But there are data that are more comfortably accommodated with one side or the other. And if you have a tree that looks like there are no branches, then I think a creationist can look and say, well, you know, where's the line? Whereas if you saw a, a line that looked like it was pretty gradual, even if the, uh, even if the dates didn't completely match, 
you could say, well, see, there's our line. What are you going to do about it? And the creationists would have to come back with some kind of, well, apes and humans interbred, and there are half apes and half humans, and quarter apes and three quarter humans, and quarter human and three quarters apes, and so forth. And so now you have your gradation. Um, so I don't see this as a silver bullet in either direction. And furthermore, I think that if one is an evolutionist, one should be able to approach it trying not to allow evolutionary presuppositions to overwhelm the data. And I think if one is a creationist, one should be able to approach it without letting creationist presuppositions overwhelm the data. Uh, now, these guys may be biased. I don't think their data are. Takanaboy is there whether we interpret him as being um, slightly deficient human or whether we interpret him as being uh, uh, the next to the last step on, a step on the ape to human transition. And so I see books like this being more valuable in the data they collect than I do in either the opinions they uh, elicit from other people, although that's helpful, or mm -hmm. the final synthesis they make. Because really, the data are primary. And I think that our job in this whole situation is to look at the data as carefully as possible. And one of the things I appreciate about the book is that it does give you more data. There are places where I'd love to have uh, a little more data, like uh, what happens to Zika virus uh, when they grow up? We may not know that because we may not have diagnostic criteria, but you know, is, is microcephaly in uh, Africa or Brazil or someplace? Uh, from a decade or two ago, does it give you heavy brow ridges? I'd like to know that. Because if it does, then that lends credence to the belief that these are humans that have degenerated by viral means. If not, it means that we're going to have to find some other reason for explaining it if we're going to try to fit it into a creationist model. Um, and I think that an evolutionist should be interested in that question as well. Uh, Isn't there, uh, wasn't there quite a, a ruckus about dating of Turkana? Uh, several conflicting IDs about its 1.6 million year date. Does he discuss that? Um, not yet. I, I think that he's going to discuss dating methods in, uh, in general. I don't know whether he gets around to Turkana boy in particular. Um, I do know that he mentions, at least in passing, the uh, Skull 1470 uh, uh, debacle, where you can get whatever date you want if you ask the right uh, 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 laboratory to do your dating. Uh, and it's actually slightly worse in some ways than what he's portraying. Uh, because there's some of those crystals that they just ignored because they're 200 million years old. And at that point, you're going, what? Do we have uh, genetic material from Erectus? We don't have known genetic material. Um, one of the things that I found striking was that apparently, 3,000, 4,000 year old material can contain, uh, you know, genetic material in it that, that's good enough for publication. So I find it, I find it fascinating to ask that question. Of course, the question then is, who is going to give you a little piece of uh, Dubois original material? 
can I have a, you know, something from the inside of the skull or something? Uh, they, uh, when they did it with the Canaanites, they used a temporal bone. I think that the idea is so new that people aren't actually looking at, uh, haven't really started to look at, well, can we do this on 1.6 million year old material? Because the prejudice has been no. But nobody's looked because they know the right answer. And we don't know for sure, but it may very well be analogous to uh, saying, well, there can't be red blood cells in those dinosaur bones because they're too old. If, if you had a um, population spreading from, from Babel, um, I'm wondering if you could, you, if you, on the periphery of that population, the, the bleeding edge as it, as it spreads out, whether you might have greater, how, not greater, how can I say this? It's actually n narrower genetic variation than the population that stays towards where everybody left and then they interbreed with other populations around them. Does that make yeah. sense? Well, it would depend, I think, on how you, it's like the, dif the difference between precision and accuracy. If you have a bullseye and you have four arrows clustered around on the side, they have very good precision. They do not have very good accuracy. If you have uh, an arrow here, an arrow here, an arrow here, they have better accuracy without having better precision. Because if you average them, you actually get to the bullseye. <laughs> and maybe one of them is in the bullseye you know, uh, whereas these other ones are all really tightly uh, clustered, but off to the side. And, and that's part of what you're going to see. You're going to see founder effects where all of the founders are going to survive. Well, the ones that didn't, they die before, they, before we get uh, uh, remains from them. Uh, but, but in general, you know, if you're a human and you're going out and there's nothing else around you, I mean, unless, you know, a saber-toothed tiger comes into your camp at night, uh, you're pretty well, uh, you know, you're not competing with any other humans. And so if you, if you can, can figure out a way to compete with the rest of uh, the environment, uh, you pretty much have the place to yourself and your kids. So... Uh, and, and founder effects, you know, if you move out and you have kids, the kids have nobody to uh, procreate with except each other. And so now you're going to have a very tight genetic uh, group. But you're going to have th that genetic group could be easily fairly far removed from the average. In fact, it may tend to be that way because the weirdos get dri driven out first. So that's, I mean, that's what I'm sort of speculating is that, um, that, you know, what we call modern humans with, with our skull shape is maybe, is maybe the average uh, of the original population, but then uh, those with the, with the skulls with Homo erectus, but these are people that um, basically headed off and they had only themselves to interact with so they couldn't, you know, they had sort of limited genetics to work with. Um, uh, and that might explain the difference between these populations. Uh, I think that's reasonable. And we have a comment here and then... Well, how much change could happen or how fast? I think would be affected quite a bit by how much selection pressure there is. And uh, assuming there is genetic variability there in the in the gene genome, and in a in a catastrophic change, rapidly changing world, you probably have a lot of selection pressure in various directions. Well, I think it's more than selection pressure. You have to remember that natural selection doesn't do a thing. All it can do is select from the variables that are already there. 
So in order to get that kind of stuff, you have to have not just natural selection, but mutation. Uh, it raises a very interesting question of whether there was more mutation immediately after the flood or not. So I, but I would argue that it's not, it's not even, um, it's not even selection, but it's just who the founders were, just randomly what characteristics do they have. You know, yeah. they have a big nose, they have low set ears, you know, whatever, you know. Um, they have know, flat foreheads and heavy brow ridges. Yeah, yeah, if, if they just happen to be like that, then, then that's, that's what their population group looks like. Uh, well, it takes, can take more than mutations. Um, <clears throat> Look at all, all the tremendous variation in dog varieties, okay? That that's, is, is a unique thing in the animal world. And apparently that's not, that's mostly not from mutation. It's understood to be epigenetic uh, changes. And so, um, I mean, it happened much too fast to be evolution. And so the, the humans did the selecting, but the point is you need, you need uh, inherent the variability within the genetic system, things that can be epigenetically yeah, selected. Yeah, it could be epigenetics then, instead of genetics. And, and then you need some kind of choice to, to indicate what's going to happen. Right, right. But the thing of it is, if everything survives, then weird stuff survives. Go ahead. Uh, Doug raised an important point is, can you have dispersal from Babylon, Tower of Babel? And that's a valid uh, question to raise. I've been trying to read all the creationist literature I can on Tower of Babel. It's, I have an archaeological mind, an archaeological bent, as well as geological. Most of the dating I see puts it at a minimum of 100 years after the flood and a maximum of 300 years. So you have a window of about 200 years. If you take the average um, <clears throat> time, the 200 between 100 and 300, 200 years after the flood would be around 2000 BC, 2100 BC. Mm -hmm. If you look at all of the human fossil finds that are dated approximately there, they're all fully modern. You just don't have any aberrations. So there, there's a crying lack of evidence. Maybe it'll come in the future, but there's a crying lack of evidence right now for, let's say, Neolithic. Shouldn't you have, or Cro-Magnon man, shouldn't you have in the Cro-Magnon caves at least a few of the, um, you know, the Ergaster and some of these other types? Well, to be fair, for Neanderthal, which we covered last week, there's pretty good evidence that the Neanderthal DNA has been incorporated into modern humans uh, to a measurable extent, not overwhelming, but a measurable extent. And there's one other thing that we have to consider is that, uh, let's presume by hypothesis that these are mostly post-flood. Um, then you have to be careful about reading the biblical story to absolutist. And by that I mean that it is entirely possible that some groups broke off and moved out well before the Tower of Babel. But the Tower of Babel represented the majority who clustered in one area That's and God scattered them enough. And then as he scattered them, they, they ran into these other groups and the two, you know, the two waves merged with each other and now it's basically impossible to distinguish between them. I think that's a likely uh, scenario. Um, with the Tower of Babel scenario, you have a similar thing to the hunter-gatherer hypothesis that you can have a lot of inbreeding. I think we would all agree that one reason the Lord had to disperse humanity, if they had stayed much more than 100 or 200 years right there in the Euphrates Valley uh, in Babylon, there would have been so much inbreeding that maybe you'd have a lot more genetic changes. 
But we don't have that. We don't have that. Well, one of the things that's interesting is that the one that's been published and the, that they've summarized, the claim is made, and I presume based on the genetic data, that uh, it was a, a woman whose mother and father were half-brother and half-sister. Or to be fair, it could have been uncle and niece or aunt and nephew because it would be the same genetic distance. I'm not sure how they're sure that they're half-brother and half-sister, but... Uh, and then beyond that, there was probably some interbreeding between the, the uh, parents of the parents as well. So it looks like there's a pretty, pretty much of an inbred group. Now, that actually happens in, you know, modern days. They, they're places in the uh, Appalachians where you don't get out of the valley. Mm -hmm. And everybody marries their cousin because there's nobody else to marry. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, well, there's, there's a problem with the royal family, too. And once genetic problems get into the royal family, it's, it's a huge mm -hmm. uh, problem. It, uh, hemophilia, I think it's hemophilia A, is rampant in the in the European royal family. The European royal family? Yeah. The Habsburgs married the... Everybody in the kings and queens, they wanted a princess to marry their prince. Um, I can give an example. I've, in my early career, I was a pastor. I won't tell you where it was, but I had church members, husband and wife, that were first cousins. I don't know how the law <laughs> allowed that, but they were married. They had kids. Now, actually, that's the closest the law will allow. They will allow. Okay. Okay. Anyway, they're yeah, unfortunately... Brother and sister, a half-brother and half-sister, that's no, no. Unfortunately, their oldest son turned blind by the time he was 18 years old. So, And the experts say that was a genetic problem that cropped up because of the close uh, intermarriage. Mm -hmm. Well, you, you have that kind of problem with Ashkenazi Jews. Right, right. Uh, so even people who have, you know, the opportunity, if they don't avail themselves of, of an intermixture, why, it, it can be a problem. Yeah. I, I, I still would like to see the two authors have a follow-up book on uh, genetic changes and how much time it takes for genetic changes. Oh, That's a missing piece for what of it their is puzzle. Worth, they totally. are promising that book. Oh, good. Good. <laughs> I didn't know that. They read my mind. <laughs> <laughs> well, great minds think in the same lines. Yeah. So, I mean, could we, uh, with our theory that these, these groups represent spread from, from Babylon, maybe after the flood, but before Babylon spread. Um, could we generate a hypothesis that if we could get genetic material, that homogal homologous chromosomes might be identical? In other words, clear evidence of inbreeding. Yeah, well, the, the truth of the matter is that from my perspective, I'm happy to see that the that the agreement is that this uh, Neanderthal woman had a half brother, half sister marrying each other. Yeah. I mean that. Yeah. That makes sense uh, according to the way I'm looking at things, and that there was evidence of f further closeness between the parents as well. I mean, between you know, parents, parents as well. So I, I'm thinking that we're that we actually do have some evidence that this kind of thing happened. Um, and then, of course, if the new wave comes, it's actually an advantage to everybody uh, to uh, marry between the groups because then uh, all of the recessive traits don't pop up. Hmm. Anyway, next week we talk about the little people. Flores, um, the hobbits.